Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, one of the reasons that I first got interested in the format of documentary storytelling was based on my aunt and uncle being anthropologists, being out in the field and living in all these interesting places. And I was a young person in Johannesburg and really wanted to see different parts of South Africa because South Africa is so insular especially if you're white and middle class and come from a privileged background, you can grow up in a very divided, gated kind of reality. So I became interested in photography when I was a teenager, started photographing and studying at a documentary school called the Market Photo Workshop, which was started by David Goldblatt, who's quite a well-known South African photographer. And through that process, the camera gave me an excuse to explore different world, different lenses of South African society that I don't think I would have had the courage to do if it wasn't for that. And after being a photographer for a little while, decided to move into studying anthropology and studying participatory media because of the history of photography on the continent of Africa and the kind of colonial gaze that's been a big part of that process and the extractive nature of photography a lot of the time of people with power photographing subjugated people and as someone from that position wanting to try and address that. So studying participatory visual anthropology in um, undergrad and then grad school at Oxford gave me some theoretical focus to my practical work, but I've always been interested in using it in a practical way. How do you take what you learn in that theoretical environment and actually put it out into the world? Because I feel more comfortable being outside in the world, engaging and learning from people's stories. So with Ro and my husband, we have started Sunshine Cinema about four or five years ago, and it's slowly developing into something that's moving beyond South Africa, which we're very excited about. But essentially it's an alternative distribution platform because there aren't that many cinemas in South Africa. Data is very expensive in South Africa for people to stream films. Um, it's very hard for a lot of people to get to cinemas in big shopping malls. The tickets are very high. The choice of films doesn't cater for a wide audience. So Sunshine Cinema tries to engage that space in a provocative way. So I'll let Rowan introduce a little bit more of that now. Well, I am um, almost the complete opposite of my lovely wife in terms of my approach to learning. I, I did not pursue masters and doctorates and PhDs. I, I loved art and I loved drawing and I was uh, identified as someone who could create art at a young age and I pursued that wholeheartedly. Um, that led me to being a graphic designer by qualification and then someone, my sister actually said, you know, your photography is probably better than your design. You should maybe pursue that more. And I did that wholeheartedly so from about 1990, 1999, I, I, I left New York after uh, finishing studying and just went full tilt into photography. What I didn't quite realize was just how much work there was going to be within the South African context around storytelling. You stumble into it from a point of privilege where you've got a camera and you're asked by, uh, at that time, a lady named Laura Njikwana, who was a Kosa woman from the townships of Cape Town, said to me, you know, I need a photographer for this magazine I'm, I'm putting out about township tourism. She wanted, as a black South African woman, to own a piece of the tourism pie, which at that time was extremely um, dominated by, uh, you know, uh, privileged people from another place and space. So with her guidance, I photographed what I now call my country after seeing it for what I could never have seen it before from a point of privilege, you know, growing up in just after apartheid. So I photographed uh, many spaces and places within the community that a lot of white male South Africans at 20 years old weren't going. And that gave me a very unique point of view, which I didn't let go of and pursued uh, the start of a company that had a what I call a, a kind of post-apartheid identity that I was proud to release as a company at that stage, obviously completely uh, owned by myself, just needing to incorporate being busy. But it kind of led to this idea of what stories do we tell and how and with whom? And that's been at the core of when I say Makulu on the left, what we do is uh, we create ethical media and on the right we share media on location with Sunshine Cinema. So if you look at the picture below, this kind of represents uh, a full cycle moment of media sharing. In this case, it was a screening 
um, about water, water rights and, and water purifiers, um, an American film that we helped screen to a, a surf community in Musenberg in Cape Town. But what you start to see are elements. Inside is a Land Rover with a six kilowatt solar system. And um, on screen is a really passionate person telling about how they went on an empathetic journey away from pure profit towards using media and water purifiers to have impact in distressed areas around the world. And we were asked to help um, share that media. So if we quickly go through what we do as Mokulu, I'll just sh I'll play a quick film. It's about three minutes long. My name is Dr. Pastor Kumachi My name is Bridget Skyline Perry. And I'm HIV positive. And I'm a sex worker. I'm a child climate ambassador. Même à l'extérieur, parce que je voulais plus jouer un jeu, je voulais plus faire semblant d'être quelqu'un que j'étais pas. J'ai donc appris à tous mes amis que j'étais homosexuel. Je voyais que pour beaucoup de personnes, c'était dur à vivre. I was about 10 years old and I was told that I am not Mr. and Mrs. Wilson's child. One day, I was raped, and the same guys who raped me, raped me three times in a row. It was like somebody's addicted. There used to be that feeling, if I can't beg charcoal, then I don't think there's anything else that I can do. You now know, okay, this is not my real mom and my real daddy, but I didn't understand what it meant. Because I know that I was created for a purpose and not a purpose of destruction. I'm so very proud of Beatrice because she's someone who's now become this inspiration figure in our community and many young people really want to be like her. Some young people are very sad about the way they are found. I think we need to be more mature to understand about the culture that is in our Zimbabwe. La population homosexuelle africaine, ce sont des Africains. Il faudrait leur donner la chance de contribuer au développement du pays. I want a world where each and every person is are fully informed, they should have the most of adequate information in their fingertips. I'm glad the government and the world leaders who come up with the more programs for people who are living with HIV and it's to have a positive living and stop stigma and discrimination. I still have a good number of years to live on this earth and within that time frame, I have to make extra hard leave that impact before I die. So in terms of the approach of how we make these advocacy-based short impact films, we do workshops with various young people who are part of a thing called the Children's Radio Foundation. So the Children's Radio Foundation trains young people in various 
um, active citizen civic groups in radio storytelling and they create public service announcements around a particular issue whether it's from gun violence or gender-based violence or HIV access for youth or climate in a particular area depending on the context they then broadcast those PSAs and um, short radio clips on community radio stations that then get listened to by millions of people on a weekly basis because radio is still one of the main forms of media consumption. Um, so what we do for the p what we've been doing for the past two years is working with them on making films that align to those campaigns. So we'll do a one to two day workshop process where the young people will develop the narratives. Consent is is negotiated for like half a day, showing examples of where the films will be shown. Often the films are shown in conferences um, to policymakers. And then now with Sunshine Cinema, what we're trying to say is we need to close that gap. Wh while it's important that the films get played I at international conferences where all the decision makers are sitting, the people who are these young activists on the ground need to use these as tools within their own communities to have further impact. Yeah, I can't really improve on that. I can only talk from uh, <laughs> a point of uh, a point of experience. You know, we we're very, very, very lucky to have had the courage to, as filmmakers, turn away from commercial revenue. Commercial revenue being, we made a video. It's leading to the sale of something, and we made a conscious decision. So when we when we decided we we're going to pursue a, a different revenue stream, it was based on heart and experience that certain processes weren't really helping us grow as well as certain areas of the society around us in South Africa being a very politically, socially and uh, economically divided country. If you're just making commercial products as a filmmaker, it, it tends to kind of sit with you like this isn't having any benefit, this isn't addressing any of our issues. So when we look at our approach, it was always just, are we taking a story? Or are we making a story? That was sort of where we, we started. And then um, from making the story, how do we complete the cycle of it? You put it online and everyone's sitting there going against the algorithm of Facebook and the landscape of the digital space of how you get your video seen and how many followers you build up in your YouTube channel. And to be honest with you, when you've, when you've sat in certain spaces, you don't have the time to go and focus on your YouTube channel to build up the likes. You're in workshops with people that are opening up to you pretty emotionally and, and talking openly about you know, pretty hard hitting stuff. And the accountability on our side led us to think, well, the media should come back to them. If we're just extracting and taking the film away, how does it benefit them if they're not able to engage it and share it themselves? So as the internet opened up, yes, we were able to send data to them. They were able to pass on the film themselves, but we really thought, let's have launches of, uh, of the film screenings in the communities where the films are made. And that led us to pioneering solar cinema. So take all the elements you need for a wonderful conversation and bring them to that space. And I, when I say conversation, I really want to highlight that word. Everything we do is about the, the post-screening conversation, for sure. You know, if the conversation doesn't get going at the end of a film screening after presenting, and not just our media, hey, we've got a, a huge catalog of content from a, one, a number of wonderful partners, places, and people, and it's very tailored for each screening based on the issue within that space place that's been identified and who's leading the screening from that community. We're not leading it. We don't have the right. All we can do is offer up the soapbox and let people, you know, tailor make their own, their own screening. So if you look at this diagram, it really does try very briefly to put the full cycle into perspective. And what, what you see in the last slide in terms of future media info, uh, you know, innovation is really us coming back to a group of people that we've made a film with who have expressed an interest in developing their own ability to, to, to further tell their own story, but then present new technology to them. So in this situation, if I were to tell you the, the experience of this, this is where it starts in a workshop of consent then it moves to us not just making the film about them, but if you look around, it's, it's training on site of the people that we're working with to tell the story. So, for example, a key narrative figure will be identified, but then you'll have 
the team around them. In this case, it was a dance academy that had a very good discipline structure of getting people off the streets into a dance academy, offering them the chance to learn to dance, but giving them quite a strong uh, uh, kind of parental backbone of development. And they wanted to learn how to take better photos of themselves. So we did that while telling their story. Then it gets to the point of bring the film back to them, which is absolutely the goose flesh moment because now they're all feeling that they're unique, that they've done this hard social work, this development work, and they're being rewarded, not because of us, but because of their work that's portrayed within the film. Then the conversation that starts leads to network and uh, connections. So it, at, the, at this particular screening, someone stood up from their community and said, hey, I make music. No way, I didn't know that, let's get together. So it, spurred, it sparked internal networking, which we liked. And then later on, we maintain contact with every screening that we've done and, and pass on further information and innovation. And in this case, we had just made a virtual reality film in Kinshasa in, uh, in a, a 360 video um, about a, a, an amazing young man, Samuel, and we were sharing that with them so that they who had, uh, in this case, th this is Beth, and his brother, and Meth is super, super passionate about storytelling, so he wanted to know about 360 video and hadn't experienced it yet. So that's the, the full cycle of what we do. So the next one, the case study. So, no, I just think we'll just quickly give you some imagery about uh, Sunshine Cinema. So let me just quickly play this. It's also very quick. So this is more how we distribute the media. So this project was funded by the Open Society Foundation Public Health Program and it was during a really big conference that happens every year called the AIDS Conference and this last year, 2016, was the first time the conference was being held in South Africa again after about 10 years. But the conference is itself is very expensive to go to. It costs a lot of money. And in the context of South Africa, the youth unemployment rate is over 50%. HIV infection rates amongst young people in South Africa are actually not decreasing um, compared to other groups in South Africa. So what we were hired to do was show a film that was made by American filmmakers called Nothing Without Us, which was about the role of women in the fight against HIV globally. 
and take an extract from that film, show it around different townships in Durban to people who couldn't afford to access the conference for free. But because the film is in English and some of the literacy English understanding rates were quite low in the areas we were working in, we also hired a local theatre group that then had watched the film and made their own theatre skit that was played well, they performed it just before the main feature to relate some of the key messaging in the film to their own experiences. So one of the big issues that was in their theatre performance was around transactional relationships. A lot of young women rely on various partners to access um, school fees or airtime or transport money. So it's, it's, a form, it's, a, it's a transactional relationship that can often lead to HIV infection because you don't have the power in that dynamic to ask that condoms and preventative measures are used. So, so in that space, what was really interesting was that because we were bringing in different community activist groups from gender, from um, the Treatment Action Campaign, who are a big lobby group for ARVs to be free for all South Africans, the conversation that emerges becomes quite intergenerational so you'll have older women in the audience who are maybe nurses from the, cl the, the local clinic hearing from young women why they don't feel comfortable going to that particular clinic because of the stigma. So when we do these kinds of events, we're always coming in, putting the screen up, inviting the right people, but ensuring that we've invited a network so that someone in that audience can access a wider support network which was really interesting to see. So the lady who's talking who has the beaded necklace, she was running this incredible center from her backyard. It was a rape crisis, HIV um, little clinic. She had been trained by the Department of Health. She didn't have that much support for what she was doing, but by having the screening in her backyard, a lot of young people in that area then got familiar with her and her space and the fact that it was a youth friendly space. It was a place that they could come and access condoms or get tested or get the support that they needed. So yeah, that was a, a really great um, experience for us. And we've just had a meeting with Open Society again now in New York, and we're hoping to develop a few more of these kinds of um, grassroots activations as we go. So public health is definitely a big focus for us um, with the screening content. Yeah, and then obviously the, the narrative of how to even further complete the cycle. You can bring a film back and you can lift up an amazing human being and you can offer them that chance to just you know, speak back to their own community and really get amazing video and stills from us and training for further video and stills for them. Everybody is benefiting in that moment, but there's still the sense of parachuting in and just having this one-off screening. And, you know, at a certain point, you can ask, well, where does it stop my accountability and how far can I go? We're constantly asked, you know, saying to ourselves, we think we can go further. And that kind of led us to the innovation that we wanted to present with you guys is the sandbox. So this is sort of an overview of what we've done and we can come back to that. But, you know, if you ask yourselves, you know, how do we as a Sunshine Cinema achieve our impact? We lift up local voices that promotes local action and solutions. That's what we hope. But how do you, you know, we can't lead that. So um, I'll come back to this slide here. But if we look, just look at, uh, we're ro you know, moving around in this Land Rover and it's got all this energy and then we leave, you know, how do you get more conversations going? So we think that uh, this is the answer here. Africa. <laughs> Just because Siapaz will relate to this film and also give the local filmmakers the platform so they can show their work and we can show them to the African people. Kamalam Dingbutle Sitela, 21 years, Shalekailicha, and I want to bring something new to the people of my community. The sandbox is a cinema in a box. The Italian the sandbox just because in and the Apateka, it's easy for me to take it to anywhere I go. I think about it when you are using the solar energy, seven silanga to power up, then you are ready to screen e films for a abandoned community. The 
power of being face to face with people in a one room and we are watching the same movie. I think long ago it had a positive impact to the community and we also can engage the community, also discuss some of the challenges that we are faced with. Calvin Snow Banner Sandbox is more than hundreds throughout Africa, loading a bandit of a cool abandu so that they can access to information, they can also get education. It's really amazing like to have the sandbox, get a great innovation and people can learn a lot from it. So the idea with the sandbox is essentially to create multiple cinemas and people that can move around and access different areas all over the place themselves without needing to have an overarching kind of heavy hand on the whole thing. Um, we believe in kind of um, the Coca-Cola model of Africa, which is getting your product out there. I don't really want to, I don't drink Coke and I haven't drunk it in years, but they managed to get their product far out there and that's created an, a pipeline for distribution and what we're talking about is USB sticks with curated content. One of the problems is when you, even you guys know, you go online and you search for a movie on Netflix, how do you choose what movie to watch? You just you take the internet and think how do I find social impact content? You know, certain platforms are trying to funnel it and things like that, but what we're believing is we can curate a certain content around a certain issue and post your USB stick, and you can have uh, regular screenings, you know, in schools and community halls, and you can't ignore churches. They're an incredibly important part of the development of Africa. Um, all the religious institutions come on. We believe that you give one person a sandbox with the right content and the right conversation is going to be had. So that's what we're hoping and then uh, obviously we're very grateful to Bukle, who's our first Sunbox ambassador, who really taught us a great deal of what is needed, how to use it, its sturdiness. We've refined it further and come up with, uh, you know, really what, I'm, what I'm, I'm hoping you guys will be able to do as a network is help us refine um, the product as an offering. We don't want to necessarily make money from it, although we believe it can be a, a form of sustainable revenue generation for our, our non-profit company, but we believe the cost is too high because at the moment we're hacking it together with multiple corporate partners who you know provide battery operated HD projectors that do the screening for the certain amount of time we need, the batteries and the sound. I've, I've, I've refined it as far as I can without now taking it to a manufacturer and now streamlining the whole thing and making the case out of solar panels rather than the solar panels inside the case, you know, all of that. Goal Zero have been extremely cold in terms of their approach, so we had to go around them and actually define our own solutions to the, the issue of what goes into the box. What's Goal Zero? They're like a company that make outdoor solar, solar portable American. stuff. Um, and we, we actually bought a lot of their product in our early testing, but uh, we found that we can now, with the interest in the Sunbox, we can now approach uh, partners and funders to actually develop the whole thing from scratch. And that's kind of where we are now. We're, we're getting orders from like, hopefully, we had a meeting with the Charlize Theron Foundation and they have an interest in, in it and other philanthropic partners that can order 10 at a time. We can build a 10 box network paid for by corporate sponsors and actually then continuously try send the right content down the pipeline and, 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 and obviously get that's from a request perspective. What do you want to show? Yeah. What stories are you interested in seeing? So just creating that network would be quite, quite that's our challenge right now. And um, a little bit about the distribution of it. So people would apply to become Sunbox ambassadors based on where they are in Southern Africa. We've had about 20 emails so far from various different people, community activists wanting to show films. We even had one from Tunisia the other day which is quite far away. Um, but we now have permission from Anat Singh's production company, which is the biggest production company in South Africa, produced like a, The Long Walk to Freedom and Serafina and really big South African films. They've given us permission to show all of their films that they own the distribution rights to. But we're obviously not allowed to charge entrance for the screenings because otherwise people won't be able to come. So we are fundraising in America to get a grant that would allow the Sunbox ambassadors to get a stipend 
for their time to ensure that they are actually getting some kind of monetary exchange out of it because it's great for them to do the screenings but they also need to make a living um, so that's one thing that we're working on with it which is exciting uh, just quickly add in one other one other part of the proposed revenue stream is that in the same vein that a movie drifts down the feed on net on Netflix yeah. and how do you reinvigorate movies that have a use you know some films that you know you can mention anyone racing extinction a climate action film disappears down the feed and you're like it's still relevant you don't have to make another one how do you make it pop back up in people's social media feed we go around and do screenings of that content and provide a photo and a little spike and we send it back to the Racing Extinction Facebook page, they post about it, then that night people are sitting there thinking in any part of the world, uh, maybe I should watch Racing Extinction. So we're trying to keep, the, we're trying to do screenings way after premiere stage that keep certain types of relevant films popping back up in a broader public's uh, feed as well as doing the initial screening in a community that's needed. Um, yeah, so let's let's show you an example of that. If I go back, uh, this is this is an amazing new film that's got a lot of uh, Oscar buzz in South Africa about foreign um, language film, and it's our official nomination from South Africa. Um, it's up for the the con contention to become uh, best foreign language, and we were asked to show the film. So this film is a very controversial film in South African circles because it's about um, circumcision in Kosa culture, which traditionally is not something that is broadcast to a wider public. It has quite a secretive veil around it. The people who wrote the, the film and the people who act in the film are all Kosa men. And it's about uh, a relationship between two of the initiates in a circumcision camp in the Eastern Cape. Um, one of one of the initiates is a famous singer in South Africa and an outspoken gay rights activist, Nakane Ture. And we were asked by him and the producers to show the film in community settings because a lot of people who were contesting the film hadn't actually seen it yet because it had only been in quite exclusive um, circles in terms of film festivals and things like that. So when we screened it, we obviously have to be very careful of how we screen it and who we screen it with. So we invited a collective of traditional healer Sangomas who are um, also gay rights LGBTI activists and they led the screening with us in a community called Langa in a big township in Cape Town. Um, and it was very interesting to see because a lot of people in the room were very angry when they walked in and said, you know, I, I think it's disgusting that you're showing this film and it shouldn't be allowed and this film should never have been made. And by the end of the screening, the discussion became about like hyper masculine spaces and the patriarchal elements of a very traditional cultural space and how that needs to evolve in South Africa. But at the same time, because of where South Africa is right now, the fact that the director was white was one of the key topics, which is important because the fact that somebody from a completely outside culture had access to tell this very difficult story and it's a very beautiful film and the writers were Kosa and the actors are Kosa, the, a lot of the audience we're very focused on this, whose story, whose right is it to tell this story. But this young man who spoke had something else to say. So uh, this is just along the lines of uh, testimonials. How do we prove that our, filming, our film screenings are needed? Um, we believe that one of the best ways we can do that is, as media makers is create video testimonials post uh, our screenings, asking people, you know, literally without much prompting, what do you think, what do you think? So this is just a testimonial after the wound. As a queer black South African man who is part of Tosa culture, um, I've been very privileged to be able to see um, Ineba because I think it actually it has had the guts to bring the discourse that is so much needed in our society right now. Because for me, I think that we do a lot of using culture and using cultural practices as a way of excusing violence, as a way of excusing patriarchy, as a way of excusing hypermasculinity. 
Yeah, so we would like to obviously carry on this approach of being contacted for a specific type of screening that addresses a kind of coalface societal issue and get people talking in a room, use it as an early stage analysis of why uh, there's so much hype or, or a lot of time a lot of anger on Facebook around certain issues before the screenings even the films even released and trying to just dialogue, 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 conversation. That's that's our goal. I think that's uh, that's our our main goal is just getting the conversations had. We're being siloed more and more by Facebook, armchair activism, people thinking they're making a difference by putting something down a pipeline on Facebook. That's quite mean and it's often quite controversial in and of itself. We try, to, we try to put people in rooms to really let people be heard on both sides of the argument. If you can't do that, then aren't we just dividing ourselves more and more and more? So regardless of what the issue is, conversation can be the cure is is, is in, in its own way a, at least a part of yeah so yeah just imagine uh, a Land Rover uh, driving the so we're testing the Land Rover now the roof is completely mm -hmm. solar panels there's a six kilowatt solar rig inside inside there are a big HD screen about as big as this whole wall here that we jack up really high we can do 500 people and then we were visiting all the people we've made films with and returning the films back to them, giving them back to them in the sense of uh, it is their film. All of our films, by the way, anyone who's featured in a film that we make uh, has the right to pull their involvement in the film at any stage. And that, that's International Aid Society, doctors, everyone agrees that if the character in the film has changed and grown for three, four years down the road, you know, even if it's a three minute film or a 10 minute or 20 minute film, they can pull themselves out of that film because people change. So our consent model is very important. So we, we want to take the films back to people and that's what we're busy doing. We're, we're here fundraising to do the trip, to distribute 10 sunboxes at a time in certain locations, monitor that network and, uh, and keep the conversation going. That's kind of us. We'd love um, questions. Questions, and we can tell you a bit about our future plans, and, and we can learn from your genius mind. Yeah. 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 Yeah
a much more condensed workshop around mobile phones mm -hmm. and how mobile phones can be used as a tool to tell your own story. And we've been refining that curriculum, if, there, if, if you choose a word, every single workshop it changes. And so we bring in the gear to do this world-class production. And I, I put this as a prop. This is the latest 360 consumer camera, the Insta360 the Insta One, which plugs into your phone. And what we try and do is just bring the tools that we're now investing in to do the, 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 the commissioned work into the workshop, and we share the tools. We can only show you the way. Here are the tools that are, we are being paid to use now. Get hands-on training now. Experience what it's like to use the most expensive gear to tell a story, but also remember the iPhone or the Android phone has come a long way, and you can do a lot with just your phone. So that's our focus. Well, is actually, the, the technical, the devices, the equipment are not where the difficulty lies for me, yeah. for my team, is the, what is the story? How do you yeah. teach NGOs who are you know, grassroots, uh, they don't have any idea about what the story is and then how to tell a story. So do you, is that part of your training? That's my we do that training as well. So when we're doing the radio workshops, there's a visual storytelling element to that. And all the workshops have a key theme around them so whether it's talking back so who are you talking back to if you were standing in a room with policy makers who are deciding on which drugs would be available to you as an HIV positive young person what would you say if you had the microphone and then processing those key um, sentiments into a structure that fits the output whether it's a public service annou announcement of 30 seconds or it's a one minute clip or it's an audio slideshow so depending on the audience the theme is then catered for but it's not easy yeah at all because what we'll notice in any given room is that there's um it's like uh, are you an architect or a doctor not everyone in that room is going to have the inclination to think through the process of capturing a story so we try and identify leaders within the creative space and then create a team around that person letting that person direct that particular day or space and then the story emerges through that but we can't do it without a children's radio foundation their network of youth reporters who are training people how to tell a story just with radio is a big pivot for us because if we come in with no uh, with no kind of net having been cast and pulled back in to say these are people who are interested in telling stories you start from scratch on a very wide level and you you have to give more time to the filtering to those people that have the and I say it's a gift storytelling is a gift being able to tell a great story anyone can do it but it's still a gift to do it really well they also we use like really fun they're called icebreakers so whatever the local context the language is you'll use like a an old saying or a proverb or you'll play broken telephone which creates a bond in the room and people laughing because from what Adam says to what it, when it gets to Rowan is a completely ridiculous broken um, narrative flow so there's lots of different little techniques that are used and obviously we show examples of other content but what Rowan was saying about Someone might be the main storyteller, but somebody else might really want to hold the audio recorder and be the sound engineer, or someone really might be interested in the photography. So mixing it up in that way helps quite a lot. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm. I have two questions. The first is about um, the way in which you curate content, especially you know, in the context of South Africa. Um, some of the films you show are community-based films, so the communities are watching their own films. But other content that's made outside of the communities, um, how you curate that content. Um, and then in terms of going into these communities, how do you select the communities that you go to? Are you going mostly to townships? Are you going to rural areas? Um, what is that process? So it's very um, not cookie cutter. So it depends on who invites us in. So whether it's a local NGO that's asking us to screen a film or it's a filmmaker who has a film, like recently there has been a very popular South African Afrikaans film called Nwame Skoli, which is based on a book. And a lot of the extras and where the film was shot is a place called Ocean View. So nobody from that community had access to see it in the cinemas. Ocean View is next to Komiki and very far away from the closest mall. Um, so in that context, you get asked by the film company who want to make sure that the extras get to see the film that they're in. 
or um, we'll work with the Children's Radio Foundation around a particular theme, whether it's World Water Day or climate or um, Africa Day, depending on that and depending on the bouquet of content that we've been given permission to show. But we try and focus on showing African films predominantly because of the lack of access to them. We've shown one or two international documentaries, but our key focus is African films. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm curious about scale. Uh, you, I don't know if you had it in there specifically, but can you talk a little bit about you know, how many places are you able to go? Like, what's the sort of, sure. I guess scale as it relates to resources, right? So how, how much planning time, whether it be paid time or volunteer time, has to go into each one of these screenings to make them successful? Like even in terms of including the, um, the various like community partners, you know, like what, how many people are you sort of mobilizing to organize each of these events, and then how much uh, you know time, resources, money does that take? Sure. And then how many are they able to do like in a given year or six month period? Well, it's been obviously quite a long process of testing, you know, for us getting uh, the, the approach of building in and taking down the cinema. For us, we try and do one big screening a day to do with a big cinema. Um, and that's what's really driving the innovation around the sunbox is that's where we believe we're going to get the most scale. And the numbers start to go up when you ultimately place someone doing a screening, you know, five days a week, reaching 50 people a time, um, you know, changing the content in a classroom setting from art based screenings one day to financial literacy the next or environmental education the next. You can do that. So you can create quite a diverse day, you know, series of screenings with the sunbox. Um, Cost-wise, we're very lucky. The idea that we've come up with being the first solar-powered cinema in Africa, there are others that have done this around the world. I, I, I can't comment on them. We're just really trying to figure this out from where we are. And all I can say is that we've been very lucky. We've, people have approached us and, and helped us and, and paid us to do screenings and funded us. And now we're, we're obviously just realizing the next level of uh, innovation that's required. And that's where we're at. Cost-wise, you know, we, we can do a screening from a financial perspective. I'm going to have to talk in rands, which uh, you know, is, is going to be really affordable in dollars <laughs> right now. But um, you know, we, we look at a, a, a kind of net outlay cost spend of about 5,500 rand worth of practical spending for each screening. Um, so that's not a lot to just get the sweat equity going, get the gear out there. Obviously, we'd like to be operating in a non-profit way. Um, but sustainably, we know that there's huge risk um, to the gear if you you know driving in the middle of nowhere, and there's huge risk to uh, people in certain communities. We had a situation where we felt genuinely that there could be a backlash to us showing a controversial film, and we needed high security. So it changes, you know. It's a, it, the costs fluctuate, but we've come up with models that allow people to choose whether or not you'd like to donate a seat, meaning like 50 rand to pay for one seat, you know. It's about $2. Yeah, like $2. So, you know, we went to a movie in New York City and I couldn't believe how much I paid for a movie ticket in New York City. So, but the popcorn was very big. Um, yeah, so there's, uh, there's ways to get this funded. We're looking at also advertising on the Sunbox. Certain clients that want to associate uh, to a certain audience can actually sponsor uh, a short ad in front of the content that gets played so that there is an ad-based revenue built into the box. But we're honestly just trying to go from a sales perspective. Order one and we'll distribute it and the price is worked into that. Um, just from a practical level, what you were saying about the core team. So it's myself and Rowan, who Rowan is a videographer and I'm a photographer. And then we do the setup of the screening and wor I'll work with the local community facilitators to work out who the best MC would be for that, who the local catering company would be. So it's a fluctuating core crew of between 5 to 20 people, depending on the scale of the screening. Um, and your other question about the sunbox, the sunbox at the moment costs us about $800. So we're trying to get a, a batch order so that we can bring that cost down further, which would allow for more screenings more regularly. Because we only have the one big um, Land Rover screening setup. We don't have more than one of those vehicles at the moment.
And the biggest issue is still batteries and, and energy retention. So charge cycles based on the, the proximity, the size of your box. You know, how many uh, solar panels can you fit into the box to decrease your charge time so that you can do more screenings. At the moment, the charged cycle on solar is still, I'll be honest with you, very frustrating for what you can get out of it. And we're looking for partners and information pools where as the, as the developments happen, we can incorporate them into the, the rollout of the product because the, the obviously the quicker it charges, the more screenings can happen and uh, the, the more development that happens in the in the brightness of a projector the more you can screen during the day so we're addressing all the technological stuff and every iteration of the sunbox refines taking into account what's what's happening in the technology space I'd love to take a video is that okay with my 360 camera can <laughs> all right so this is what I'm, I'm proposing any other questions while we, while we mull over it, one or two it's more questions Lisa Parks was not able to make it. Her office is right across from us, but it's global media technologies and mm. lab. And she does a lot with um, solar panel driven television. Oh, wow. Uh, so I mean, I think it really depends on that. Cool. In that, in that area. I will write down her and name. She's written about it and uh, it continues to do field work. That's why we're here. If we can yeah. just connect to information pools and carry on. I mean, for us, we're open source. We're not trying to. Um, hide our innovation. It's a fairly easy innovation to put together. The implementation takes kind of sweat equity and that's where we are. We're, we're just the people that really believe that we can go and roll this thing out with a team and, and create a, uh, interactive spaces. Very simple interactive spaces. But yeah, so this is the plan. Um, we are going to do yes. <laughs> a video. Uh, I'm sure for the video. Okay. <laughs> so this is a, a 360 video. And all we have to try and do is get it to work properly. Are you taking a photo? Is, am I taking a photo? No, I want to do a video. I want everyone to say sunshine. No. It's <laughs> as cheesy as I could possibly be. Ryan is so cheesy, you need crackers. Okay, well, <laughs> let, me, let me get this thing ready first. Ask your question right, in the meantime. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm doing something similar. So I, I, uh, thinking about, I work with a, a group that is majority of the independent theaters here in the States. Um, around, I think there's about five in our network out of about 700 active independent theaters. And, um, and it, it, it's interesting because there's a big challenge around diversity and inclusion for the indie theaters. Um, there was a study done three years ago and you know the, the like I think it was something around 70 plus percent of uh, independent theater attendees were white middle class mm. um, or above. And, and average age was 57 <laughs> for uh, people attending independent theaters. And so uh, it's launched this big sort of initiative of how do you get young people um, back into the theaters, how do you get people of color into theaters. And so I've been working on something sort of from the opposite end, but um, I'm curious like what kind of data collection you're doing. Mm. Um, our, the model we came up with was to do something similar, but all, sort of with this ultimate goal of like converting it into a business model, uh, more of a traditional ticket-based business model. Um, of like basically finding these audiences. Mm. Um, and then a lot of that relates to sort of distribution. Um, so, you know, like who's the audience for a film? Actually, we played, um, we played that film at our festival yeah, cool. um, in Detroit in, uh, in June. And so, um, and so like who's the audience and who, uh, who does sort of Hollywood or traditional Hollywood distributors think, uh, think is an audience versus like maybe what you're finding. Yeah. You know, are there certain films that you find like, oh, we never thought this film would resonate or cause this much discussion and are you like taking that data um, in any way to like reflect back onto like traditional distribution so at the moment we are doing basic surveys and testimonials at our screenings very analog style data collection in terms of the monitoring and evaluation but with the sunbox rollout we want to do more secure monitoring and evaluation through a participatory process with the young people who would be those sunbox ambassadors so get them to do workshop feedback sessions with key community people after like a week after the screening a few days after the screening get them to get a sense of what people thought the film was going to be about and what they thought they were going to think and then do a follow-up after that so that's one of the approaches we have haven't linked in directly with proper distributors in terms of the cinema circuits like Stokinico and New Metro are our two big cinemas in South Africa and it's been quite hard to get them on the phone and say you know this is what we're doing how can we collaborate 
it hasn't really been a a, a welcoming hand in that in that sense maybe because we're not charging entrance um but yeah those are the two key ways we're doing it now but once we grow we really want to develop like an app where people could answer a question beforehand and then answer questions afterwards to consolidate that data but coming from an anthropology background it's mostly um person-to-person -person survey questions open-ended not really stats based yet yeah yeah, we can talk later about this, but they're, they're, you're doing something really interesting that most independent uh, film or distributors in general are really looking for, which is like, how do you go to the people? Yeah. Um, and so there's a way in which you could structure a financial model based on data collected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and there, there are ethical things that come up with regards to that. Um, but we, we had a similar thing where we created a type form, uh, just a simple um, link that we could put up, and then people write there after they watch the film. Like a survey monkey thing. Survey, yeah. Yeah. And they could just do it on, on a mobile device. We even brought laptops sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, we so bring tablets screening. to the screenings. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, getting, I, th I think there's, there could be some interesting capacity out, uh, outside of sort of your primary thing where you could even, um, say, for example, you took films that wouldn't traditionally sort of reach these audiences or even be marketed to these audiences and then either played some of the films or played trailers for the films and then used it sort of as like a test screening mm -hmm. model. That's a good idea. No, we've, we've got that, we had that response from Vodacom. They, they would love to brand seed at the screenings. So they, the problem for us is just you've got to build capacity. It's like building up a YouTube channel. You've certainly got to prove out that the network exists. So our strategy is get 10 sunboxes placed, monitor, prove the impact. And once we know that the numbers, uh, it's very easy to attract that revenue model. We've, we've certainly got the idea to do it, but we can't walk into a room. We have to sort of start with philanthropic. That's where we're at now with the sunboxes. Get 10 orders, get them placed, and then it's much easier to attract corporates when they can see something that is there that benefits them rather than hypothetically talking about it in the future. Because there isn't a huge culture of independent cinemas in South Africa. There's one or two, the Labia and the Bioscope. But they're part of Cine, they're part of this European network. So that's about it in terms of independent cinemas. Let's do the sunshine thing. Right. <laughs> so this is all <laughs> gonna be sunshine. On three. Ready? Everyone, one, two, sunshine. <laughs> Any data collection and conversation sparking part, there are a bunch of